I'd like to welcome you today, um, those of you in the Cato family here in the room, and any of you who are watching on our live stream or later on after it has been recorded. We, we're glad that you're able to join us here today, uh, even though it's a hard and heavy day, uh, and it always is when we gather uh, for a funeral, uh, but especially during COVID, um, when so much else is different and uh, we have lost uh, to lose Mitch, to lose a loved one in the middle of that is especially hard. But uh, we rejoice in the promises that God has given us of hope and everlasting life. And so we're going to focus in on that as well as celebrating all the ways in which God uh, did use Mitch and work through him to bless you as a family, all of you watching at home, and, and everyone here also in the St. Peter and the Arlington Heights community. Uh, for those of you that I haven't met, my name is Pastor Micah Greiner, and uh, it's my privilege to, to help guide and lead us through this service today. What we're going to do next is sing a song. Actually, uh, Peter is going to be singing it for us, but if you want to sing along quietly uh, on your own here in the room or at home, you're welcome to do that. Uh, our first song is called The Battle Hymn of the Republic, or sometimes, Mine Eyes Have Seen the Glory of the Coming of the Lord. Thank you, Peter. At this time, I'm going to invite forward some of the family to share some family memories, uh, starting with Mary Ruth. Uh, after that, Kevin, and uh, then Greg and Matt, uh, you'll be the last. So you can join us up front at the podium here. Uh, my dear Uncle Mitch, um, John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only 
Beloved Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life in heaven. Amen. My dearest Uncle Mitch, what a great honor to have you in my life. You were there for me when I was a little girl. Gave my first baby doll, Dressy Bessie. Never forget it. Uh, you were amazing. Um, you loved your family. They gave you so much joy. And I saw that every time I would visit you. Your smile will never be forgotten. May we see you again in heaven and pray for us on this earth as we still are here. Enjoy seeing the rest of your Cato family. They are happy to have you. You're a dear angel and a blessing to God. Amen. All right, guys. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Kevin. I'm Mitch's youngest. Um, I want to share a small amount of the many things that I'll remember about my dad. I'll remember my dad laughing, smiling, putting his hand on my shoulder to tell me a joke, and shaking his head with a smile and saying, that boy ain't right. Tell me to just do my best. Tell him he's proud of me. I'll remember him sitting in the stands at every game or track meet that I had. I remember the tips he would give me after. He loved watching my friends and I play ball. He would always ask about them too. He was so supportive and made it to every activity he could. He loved busy watches, as you call it. Lots of dials and shiny things. He loved Porsches had two of them. He loved the Muppets. He loved laughing at funny commercials just as hard the 30th time as the first time. I loved watching him get excited and laugh. <laughs> he would get so excited. I work in sales and drive to many businesses around Wisconsin. So every call or text would start with, where you is, boy? <laughs> or where you at today? Followed by, how's business? How's business? Did you check your oil? And at the end, love you. Tell Michelle hi for me. He loved my wife, Michelle, too. Her favorite memory is asking, you putting your face on? Every time she would be doing makeup, she'd be giving her a hard time about wearing jeans with the holes in them, her holy jeans. He loved his wife so much, too. I'll always miss being on the dance floor with mom and dad at every wedding. And they, they could really get down. He'd be, dancing, he'd be dancing to those songs we heard earlier. I'll make sure I dance with mom now, dad, every time. He loved being a papa. He would play on the ground and goof around with them, rolling around. And, he loved their big hugs and having them lay on his belly in the recliner like I used to do. I feel grateful to have had as much time with my dad as I did, but it's not nearly enough. I miss him so much already, but I'm so blessed to have had him as my dad. Thank you all. Thank you, Dad. All right, I'm going to speak as if this place is full because I know everyone watching online would be here. Um, Mitch, Dad, Mr. Mitch, Papa, neighbor. One of my earliest memories of hanging out with my dad was watching the Cubs. I must have been in kindergarten and I would lay on the floor reading stats and he would test me on Andre Dawson's batting average, an early version of flashcards. I remember going to my first Cubs game with his work friends, meeting at, United, meeting at the United Building in Elk Grove, and I got a taste of what it was like to be around his friends. We watched a lot of Cubs and Bulls games over the years, and it seemed like every game there would be a, well, the Bulls are done, or typical Cubs. 
even if the Cubs were only down one nothing in the top of the first, or if the Bulls were only up by one at halftime. I learned humility and resilience from my dad. He would often remind me, remember, there's always someone better, and there's always someone out there working. When he felt I needed some encouragement, he would say, remember, experience only means someone has a pattern of habits. Don't ever let someone look down on you because of experience. He, will, he wouldn't let me complain. He wouldn't allow it. When I would come home like many young people and complain about my situation, my dad would gently remind me, sounds like you need to work harder, boy. <laughs> One of the few times he ever raised his voice was when I, was, when I wanted to quit because a coach didn't play me enough. I remember sitting in his brown Porsche 911 with a sheepskin seat cover, and he said, you don't throw everything away because of a little adversity. Make the coaches notice you. That resilience carries over to other areas of my life. I think the thing, <clears throat> I think the thing that I would remember and miss terribly was that he was always around. At a young age, he would look through a window at my basketball practices. At high school, he would come to my football games, even though he never wanted me to play because he was worried I was gonna get hurt. In college, I remember one time, I had a panic attack over a math test. He stayed on the phone with me for an, over an hour just listening and reassuring me that a math test doesn't define me. When I became a coach, he made sure to come to games, and when he wouldn't, or he couldn't, he would text me in his caveman style, how was game? <laughs> when I would run an assembly at Thomas, he would always ask to come, as if he needed permission. He just wanted to be a part of it all. My dad loved his role here at St. Peter as Mr. Mitch, his hours were 3 to 6 p.m., and he usually say around 1 p.m., well, I gotta get ready for work. He would shower, get his uniform on, and get his briefcase ready. I would often stop by after work to simply hang out with him. I couldn't tell you how many times people would say, oh, you're Mr. Mitch's son. I was always amazed that he would talk to parents about their own families. Kids wouldn't leave the building without giving a high five to Mr. Mitch. And coworkers would come and just simply talk about their days with him, always listening, always there. I'm going to miss my dad in the stands and as my next door neighbor. <laughs> Steph is gonna miss her dad and neighbor as well. She said he was always content to be in the background so that other people could shine. Cooper is gonna miss the famous Papa oatmeal with syrup breakfast, reading the paper, and his rides to school. Carter is gonna miss his fan on the sideline, the high Papa, and the big hug when he runs into the house. Penny's gonna miss the big smiles and laughs. In the last couple of years, while the advice and conversation slow down a bit, the listening, smiles, and presence stayed consistent throughout. I can only hope that I can build a legacy as strong as this one and be a dad as good as he was. But he left big shoes to fill. I love you, Dad. few words for dad. It's a strange thing to be speaking in this space where I spent so much time as a kid. We went to church and school here. When I didn't walk to school here, dad would often drive me to school. And they were often really quiet car rides. I didn't say very much. <laughs> I was just kind of quiet sometimes, and I think I got some of that from him. But what I wouldn't give to have one of those car rides back. Just one more conversation to tell him how grateful I am for everything. I'm grateful for the time watching Sesame Street and Mr. Rogers. I'm grateful for every comic book that he would bring me when I was sick. I'm grateful for every slapstick movie and every Western we'd go see together. I'm grateful for every trip 
to a new place he knew that we just had to experience, from the Great Smoky Mountains to the Grand Canyon. I'm grateful for every album he'd bring home with such enthusiasm, from Paul Simon to James Taylor, from John Lee Hooker to B.B. King. I'm grateful for every Christmas, every Christmas, that he and mom would work so hard to make special for us. And every Halloween that he'd get such a kick out of spooking the neighborhood kids with that wolf mask. <laughs> I'm grateful for every Muppet sketch and every Geico commercial. I'm grateful for the way that he was so proud of me for marrying Chris. <laughs> He loved you too. <laughs> I'm grateful for his stories about West Virginia and his parents and his time growing up there and how proud he made us to be a Cadle. I'm grateful for every quotable quote from, take it easy, Greasy, you got a long way to slide. And after every brotherly fight, when he'd look me in the eye and say, Matt, your brothers are the best friends you'll ever have. I'm grateful for every time that we laughed out loud and every quiet moment that we sat together. I want to share with you the last text message exchange that Dad and I had. We didn't text that much. I usually texted pictures to Mom and Dad together of what the girls were doing. But sometimes I'd think of something that I knew that Dad would get a kick out of. Sierra and Maya were doing this Halloween project, and it was a Frankenstein project. And it made me think of this Mel Brooks movie. And so I took a picture of it, and I sent it to him. I said, hey, Dad. It's pronounced Frankenstein. And I pictured him laughing. <laughs> Don't worry, Dad. I told the girls, too, how it's pronounced. They're either growing up laughing or rolling their eyes at me, but either way, we're going to remember you. Anyway, Dad texted back a laughing emoji, and that was really our last, our last text, which feels entirely appropriate. <laughs> I am so grateful for everything. He was a good dad. He was a really good dad. It was hard at the end because he often couldn't find the words to say very much. But even when he began to lose his memories, he did not lose his love for us. The last time that I saw him in person in California, he did what he always did whenever we parted. He wrapped me in this bear hug. Dad was bigger than me. He was taller than me. And so when dad would hug me, it would just, he would just envelop me. And as he was giving me that bear hug, he would tell me he loved me every time. When I got the call first from mom that he'd had the cardiac arrest and then from Kevin for the FaceTime call and then from Greg that he was gone three calls in 24 hours, I cried so hard each time. But then I thought of dad, and I knew that if he was with me, he'd wrap me in that bear hug, and he'd tell me he loved me, and that it was all going to be all right. Dad isn't with us anymore in the way that he used to be. His voice, his eyes, his smile, that laugh, those have gone on. But his love, his love remains here with us in us, all around us, wrapping us in that big bear hug. He loved us, and Dad, we love you too. And so now here in this place, we turn to the source of that love. I chose these two scripture readings because they speak to a love that remains even when everything else passes away to a people longing, waiting in an Advent hope, the prophet Isaiah says these words in the 54th chapter, the 10th verse. For the mountains may depart, and the hills be removed, but my steadfast love shall not depart from you, and my covenant of peace shall not be removed, says the Lord, who has compassion on you. Word of God, word of life, Thanks be to God. And then the Apostle Paul writes in a letter to the Romans these words, in the 8th chapter, the 38th and 39th verse. 
For I am convinced that neither death nor life, nor angels nor rulers, nor things present nor things to come, nor powers nor height nor depth nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Word of God, word of life, thanks be to God. Amen. All of our time with dad was grace. Just grace. And now we lean on God's amazing grace. This next song is from Los Angeles, from a dear friend of mine and part of our LA Lutheran Church community. Here's Tyra Dennis with Amazing Grace. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. was blind but now I see twas grace that
Peace and blessings, Cato family. That was fantastic. Thanks, Matt, for uh, the gift of that from your friends uh, to you, the Cato family, and to all of us as well. Um, you know, it was awesome for me to hear each of you uh, telling your story about Mr. Mitch. And I feel like uh, the little bit that I knew of him now is, you know, much larger. Um, to hear of his love for you as his family and his servant's heart for so many others, I saw that in spades every day from three to six when he'd be here faithfully loving and serving the students in our school and this community as a whole. Um, I didn't know about the Porsches. That was interesting. And I'm trying to figure out how that fits with Muppets. And I'm not sure they're connected, but, but that's, I guess, Mr. Mitch, right? And I love his sage words of wisdom and advice from a life well lived, um, from uh, a legacy of faith that uh, blessed so many uh, and blessed you as a family and blessed me as his pastor and friend. Um, and that last part, uh, Matt, you were talking about um, how he just would wrap his arms around you. And I feel like I missed out a little bit on life by not having a Mr. Mitch bear hug. But... Um, <laughs> Someday, maybe, uh, when Christ makes all things new, I'll have a chance to. But it reminded me of a passage of Scripture that I'd like to turn your attention to. And it's one of my favorite stories in the life of Jesus of when he miraculously healed a girl uh, who was very sick, in fact, who had died. And you may know the story well. He was early in his ministry. He was going around uh, the Sea of Galilee. And he had just crossed over. And a leader of a local synagogue, his name was Jairus, came to him because he had heard that this man had the ability to heal the sick. And his daughter, someone he loved deeply, kind of like I hear in the love that Mitch had towards you as his sons and you as his daughters-in-law, Debbie as his wife and his, his dear friends and family. And, and you can imagine the heart of a father for a daughter who was very, very sick. And so he ran to get any help he could. And he'd heard of this Jesus. Maybe he had seen him perform a miracle. Maybe he had even heard him speak. He had some kernel of faith in him, it must be, because he came to him and said, my daughter, my little daughter is dying. Please come and put your hand on her so that she will be healed and live. And so Jesus went with him. Now, if you're familiar with this story, I'm reading from Mark's gospel here in the fifth chapter. Um, what you may recall is that on the way, Jesus got distracted <laughs> and sidetracked, you might even say. He was passing through a crowd, and there were often crowds around him when a woman um, who had a, a long time issue with um, bleeding reached out in the middle of the crowd and thought to herself, um, if I just touch the corner of his robe, then maybe I will be healed. And that's what she did, and miraculously she was, and Jesus stopped in the middle of this crushing crowd with all of these people around him to figure out who it was who had reached out to touch him and had been healed. And I could almost imagine being Jairus in that moment and wondering, why is he stopping? Um, I had finally gotten through to him. I had finally uh, convinced him to come with me. My daughter is sick and dying, and now he's trying to figure out who in this crowd reached out and touched him. And I can imagine as a father, I have two kids, right, um, my level of urgency rising and my level of fear um, going off the charts knowing that these few precious moments um, might mean the end for my daughter. Um, but we don't see Jairus making a big deal of it. Um, maybe he just was standing at the sideline, tapping his toes, counting the time. When, when the word came 
that his worst fears had come true. While Jesus was still speaking, verse 35, um, some people came from the house of Jairus, the synagogue leader, and they said the words that no father would ever want to hear. Um, Your daughter is dead. And I could imagine for all of you um, to hear that call, to get the news from the doctor, to, to realize that, wow, all of a sudden, this life well lived was going to be coming to an end within a matter of hours, days at the most, um, a life cut short. Now, in Mitch's case, it was a long life well lived. And sitting here today, watching here from home, we can say, well, at least there's that. He did so much. He got to travel and see the world. He got two Porsches, I guess. That's pretty awesome. He has three wonderful boys, and he got to love and serve so many kids here as well. A life well lived. We can say that, and it's true, right? And, and we can comfort ourselves with the fact that he had a good long life. But I'd like to suggest to you tonight that the reality is still the same, and that is that when we hear those words, Mitch is gone, it kind of steals a little something from us, doesn't it? And not just for you as the family, for for me too. When I first saw the message come through, I said, oh, no, Mr. Mitch, I didn't even know he was sick. I don't know what happened, but I felt the loss of a friend. And, and what I want you to just dwell with me for a moment is in that reality that this death, um, diabetes, uh, heart failure, COVID, all the other stuff that might be distracting us and stealing our hope and joy and life and loved ones, this is deeply and fundamentally wrong. Let's just call it what it is. Death is not anything good. It's not the way it's supposed to be. It's not the happy ending to a good long life. It is, it is an interruption to God's best for us and his plan for us. It's a rude interruption to what should be a life that has no end. And when we are faced with the finality of it, when our lives are jarred by the abruptness of it, when it shakes us to our core, it reminds us that this is not the way it's supposed to be. For Jairus, it was the news from some of his trusted friends, maybe some family in his house, saying the terrible news, your daughter is dead. They went on to say this, why bother the teacher anymore? You see, because they assumed that for her, for this little girl, that was it. There's nothing more. There's no hope. There's no reason to bring the doctor, the nurses, the healer. There's, there's nothing more. Her life was over. But overhearing them, um, Jesus told Jairus, don't be afraid, just believe. I like how Jesus says just enough. Sometimes we wish he said a whole lot more, right? Okay, like, don't be afraid, Jairus. Just believe I'm going to go and I'm going to raise your daughter from the dead. It's all going to be okay. Like, sometimes we wish he would just tell us a little bit more. Like, why does this happen, right? Why would a stubborn little infection in a toe uh, spread throughout a body and bring down a man who was so strong and so tall and so full of love who would just wrap you in his arms and would give and give and give and love and love and love and serve and serve and serve. Why does this have to happen? Jesus doesn't answer all of our questions, at least not as fully as we like. But what I've observed is he does tell us everything that we need to know. So just follow with me a little while longer. He says, don't be afraid, just believe. And we're left to assume that's what Jairus did. Okay, if Jesus said it, we'll believe it. 
Um, he proceeded on to the house of this leading man in his town, his city, in his synagogue. And when he entered the house, he didn't let anyone else enter with him except for Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. These were three of his closest friends and disciples. And so when they came to the home of the synagogue leader, Jesus saw a loud commotion with people crying and wailing loudly. And that was the custom of the day, to grieve the loss, especially the loss of a, a young girl, a child. And he went in and he said to them, why all this commotion and wailing? The child is not dead, but asleep. Now, you may know that in Scripture, uh, falling asleep is sometimes used as a euphemism for dying, right? And I think part of it comes back to this very moment right here. Uh, and we know now uh, some of what Jesus meant then and means when he says we fall asleep and we put up a headstone and sometimes it says rest in peace, is we know that when Mitch's body will be returned to the earth, it's actually just temporary and a day is coming when his body will be resurrected and perfected for everlasting life and his spirit which now rests in the heavenly places with Jesus will be planted back in that body and he will dance again with you, Debbie for forever, right? And maybe he'll drive Porsches too, I don't know. I can hope for that, right? <laughs> right? And he'll enjoy all of the wonderful things of this life, but even better for forever. That's our resurrection hope in life. That's what we cling to. That's what fills us with hope in a moment like this. But Jairus, and even Peter, James, and John, and all the others that were there that day, certainly the wailers and the mourners who were there to grieve, they didn't know all of what Jesus had in mind to do and I'm not sure if you remember this, but here's what they did. <clears throat> Verse 40, but they laughed at him. For the record, not a good idea. <laughs> Don't laugh at Jesus. Um, certainly in this way, right? Laugh with him. I think he would be the life of the party and he would have the best jokes. I'm talking about Jesus and Mitch. Maybe he's got some really good ones. Um, but they're laughing at Jesus here because what he's saying doesn't make sense. Because our experience with death, your experience with death, has been singular. That is, when people die, they stay dead, right? That's all we've ever experienced. That's as much as we can say from our own life and story. They laughed at Jesus because they didn't know what he was there to do. They didn't know who it was who was speaking to them. Uh, Jesus didn't lecture them. He didn't re rebuke them. He didn't tell them they were a bunch of fools who were making a big mistake. He, he just kind of went on to do what he had come to do. And after he'd put them all out, it says, he took his, the child's father and mother and the disciples who were with him and went to where the child was and he took her by the hand and I almost imagine him sitting down at the edge of the bed. Right, where she was laid out there in her house. And I can almost imagine like when I wake my kids up in the morning for school, right, or after a nap, and I can imagine Jesus just sitting down at the end of this little girl's bed and, and saying to her these words, Talitha kum, which in Aramaic means, little girl, I say to you, get up. What I see in this moment is this beautiful picture of tenderness and love that Jesus had for this little girl, that he took time out of his very, very busy day and very important life to sit at the end of her bed and say to her, it's time to get up. And just like uh, on Christmas morning, maybe when you wake up your kids or when Papa would wake up the grandkids, I don't know how it worked in the Cadle's house, uh, but I could almost imagine him saying to some of you, it's time to get up. We have a great day planned today. It's going to be so much fun. Jesus said to her, Talitha kum, little girl, I say to you, get up. And immediately, the girl stood up and began to walk around. We're told she was about 12 years old. That's how old my daughter is right now. And at this, they were completely astonished. You see, here's the thing. Jesus was sent here to this earth 
we're celebrating his birth in this season of Advent and Christmas. He was sent into this earth to confront this ugliness of illness and death. He's come to this earth to walk into cemeteries and fields and places where bodies have been laid to rest. He's come to this earth to sit on the edge of beds of little girls and little boys and of Mitch himself. And one day we have this hope and this promise that he will say to Mitch, it's time to get up. I've got so much planned for you. And not just for one day, but for a day and a world and a life that never ends. You see, Jesus entered into the room that day with the full power of God to destroy death and to destroy sickness and to destroy fear and doubt and all of the things that go with it. He entered into the room that day and with a simple little phrase, Talitha kum, he turned death on his head and the world upside down and he brought forth life. One day... Soon, we hope, Jesus will come for Mitch and he will say the same to him and he will invite him to rise to everlasting life. And he'll say the same to all of you. Every woman and man, every girl and boy on the planet, he will raise again. And with Mitch, and with all those who simply take Jesus at his word and trust him by faith, we have this promise that it will be into a life that has no end. A life filled with joy. A life filled with hope. A life filled with everything good. We're not there yet. But it's coming soon. For now, his spirit is in the presence of Almighty God. And with all the saints and angels, they're gathered around his throne, singing him worship and praise. And he's waiting for the day that we're all waiting for, where Jesus brings us into life that is everlasting. My friends, my hope and my prayer for you in the room today and all of you who are watching at home is that little story of hope and joy for the little girl that day which is true for Mitch and is true for you and I is true for all of you and gives you the hope that you need to journey through the valley of the shadow of death and gives you the strength you need to endure such grief and loss and gives you the hope that can never be taken away. May that Jesus, may that powerful, mighty Savior wrap his loving arms around you today and never let you go. Amen. At this time, uh, we're going to continue with another song, a, a great song of hope and encouragement on eagle's wings. If you want to sing along, the words should be available for you as well on the screen. And he will raise you up on eagle's wings. The breath of dawn make you to shine like the sun and hold you in the palm of his hand. You who dwell in the shelter of the Lord, who abide in his shadow. i 
need not fear the terror of the night, nor the arrow that flies by day. Though thousands fall about you, near you it shall not come, and he will raise you up on eagle's wings. Shine like the sun and hold you in the palm of his hand. For to his angels he's given a command to guard you. You dash your foot against a stone, and he will raise you up on eagle's wings, bear you on the breath of dawn, make you to shine like the sun. And in the palm of his hand. Let's go to God in prayer. Almighty God, Heavenly Father, we give you thanks that in your wisdom and grace you have given life and now eternal life to your servant, Mitchell Cadle. Although we grieve his passing, we rejoice that you have redeemed and restored him through the death and the resurrection of your Son, Jesus Christ, and through the power of your Spirit you have granted him faith, and that faith in your promise has guaranteed him eternal life. We pray that as we gather to grieve his passing, we would be comforted by the assurance that his spirit now rests with you and that while his body will be returned to the earth, it is there but for a moment and one day will be raised and perfected, his spirit reunited with it and entering into everlasting life in a world that has no end. Until that day, keep us steadfast and rooted in your word and spirit. Keep us connected to the community of believers here and throughout the world so that together we might encourage one another and all those who grieve. Uh, we pray that you would strengthen us through the season of Advent and Christmas, celebrating the coming of a Savior. Let that truth and let that promise that is fulfilled remind us that you will fulfill all of these promises and we can hold on to you with certainty and hope. Comfort us in our grief, reassure us in our sorrow, and grant us as well the gift of eternal life. For these, Lord God, in all things, we offer these prayers in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, adding to it the prayer that he has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. And now may the peace of God, which passes all human understanding, keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you his peace. Amen.
This concludes our services for Mitch today. I want to thank all of you, the family gathered here, and all of those of you who have joined us online for joining us. And I pray that all of you would continue to keep Debbie and all of the family in your thoughts and prayers, especially in the weeks and the months that are to come. The Lord bless and keep you in the remainder of your day.